expensive glaze to make. It is an expensive glaze because of the materials and because of the firing that goes into it. She developed, as I said, six types of iridescent glaze going from red to gold, and you will see a wide variety of those in here. Many times in firing the kilns, if the kiln did not come out the way she wanted to, she would simply close the door and refire. Uh, again, developed, she developed their own kilns, and, and the firing was, was critical to the finish in the pots themselves. Her iridescent glazes were not made available to the public. She kept those records private. And today, Puabic Society, Inc. is producing glazes very similar in some parts, but they're not able to use the materials such as she did in lead and other uh, chemicals and minerals that are just not being used by potters today, particularly in any circumstance like that. We have on the wall here a number of individual pieces, and I'm delighted with this show, this venue for the show, because the light is of such a caliber that the Puabic pots literally sing. And often, um, light is a critical factor, and, and galleries often do not have the kind of light that this needs. Um, so on these walls, you'll see also there are marks with the individual pots so that you're able to observe the pot bottom. Mary Chase rarely ever signed anything. If it is, it's marked Puabic Detroit or Maple Leaves Puabic. But on this particular pot, she has signed the bottom of it, Mary Chase Stratton. It was one of her favorites and one that pleased Mr. Freer a great deal. Charles Freer bought a number of Puabic pots. Uh, he gave three to the Detroit Museum of Art. And it's the only Western pottery included in the Freer Gallery of Arts collection today. There are 35 examples. Uh, obviously, Mr. Freer's died in 1919. The examples stop and preclude any of the glaze developments that happened after that. Mary Chase Perry continued to develop glazes up until the 1950s. She lived until 1961 when she died at the age of 94. Her assistant, Ella Peters, came to work for her in 1938. And during my course of education, I had the delightful pleasure of spending 17 years working with Ella Peters, uh, learning about Puabic and its glazes. And um, it is really a, a treat to see all of these examples in this show. And I know that the public is going to like it as well. I've arranged these two vessels here to demonstrate some of this unique qualities of Puabic pottery. I spoke earlier about this piece, the blue mat 201 glaze, and spoke about the iridescent glaze being put over top of it. And from your perspective now, this pot appears gold or bronze, but it's actually a blue iridescent glaze. It's a rather magnificent glaze. And when I turn it to another angle, you can see the blues that are in this, this pot. And it has the blue 201 era matte glaze first, fired, and then glazed a second time with an iridescent glaze to give it this, this bright gold finish. Now many times Mrs. Stratton didn't hope for that bright gold. She wanted a more matte gold and she would treat the glaze accordingly. This is one of the characteristics that makes Puabic quite unique. Another feature of the show is we focused a little bit on the yellows and orange that Puabic produced using chrome and uranium. Today we don't think of uranium as a uh, glaze material, but Mary Chase used uranium to achieve some of these effects. Um, we have several examples here. These, these two here are from chrome. These other oranges are from uranium. So we're glazed in a bright white glaze, bright meaning shiny, with the uranium glaze put over top of it. This particular one is a yellow glaze bottom, yellow glaze pot, fired a second time with the glaze over top to create that special effect. Um, these are not found too often, and uh, we're very happy to have this grouping as part of the show. One of the things, if you were a friend of the Strattons, you would usually get a Christmas card made out of clay, and on the back side it would say, greetings from WM, 
and Mary Chase Stratton. During the Second World War, they produced jewelry, uh, buttons, pins, earrings, uh, as part of their effort to survive, and also uh, souvenir tiles for organizations and for individuals. There's an oval one from the Realtors Association. And this wonderful one here, In Detroit, Life is Worth Living, produced for the Detroit Board of Commerce about 1910, showing the Detroit skyline, a winged wheel for transportation, hammers for construction industry, anchor for the marine trade, and plants for agriculture. Also, and during the time frame, they produced other sorts of things, lighting devices such as this hanging lantern with a reticulated butterfly design, and bowl cigarette boxes or jewelry boxes with lids, very decorated, very highly glazed during the late 1940s and early 1950s. Even some bowls from the 30s, quadrifoil, with beautiful glazes, sometimes different glaze inside and another glaze out. Again, we have some of the marks on these various pieces for you to see. I mentioned before that Puwabek pottery expanded into tile making, both, both for public and private spaces and sacred spaces as well. And we highlight just a few of those in this show. We have some pieces from the Scott Fountain on Belle Isle in Detroit, a pair of seahorses, a plaque from the Griswold House Hotel Bar of 1910, with two monks toasting themselves, and a tile that was used in Cass Technical High School in Detroit, 1917. And in this particular one, the two monks are back to back as though contemplating their glass of wine. This was an early tile installation from the Michigan Art Building, now demolished, with one foot square tiles showing a, a scene, a panoramic scene in the background of the fireplace itself. We'll spend a little bit of time and look at uh, four private residence installations. There are many, many tile installations beginning in the year 1907, going up to 1966 when the pottery closed and was given to Michigan State University. An interesting thing about Powabic, we saw how expensive it was with the lamps and shades, that in all of the years of Powabic's existence, 1903 to 1966, the total gross sales, pottery, tile, clay, glazes, everything, did not exceed $1,200,000. In comparison, a pottery like Rookwood in Cincinnati in 1929 alone sold nearly $1 million in pots that single year. So Powabic is a rare commodity. Let's have a look at some of the residential designs. In the exhibit, we selected four uh, residential designs, uh, one of which is open to the public. The other three are private. On my far right is the entertainment room of the Dodge Gray House in Detroit's historic Indian village. The house was built by John Dodge for his daughter's wedding present. And the tiles above the fireplace denote various forms of entertainment in the four by fours and a history of dance in the oblong panels. They are largely unglazed, oxide-tinted tiles with iridescent individual one-by-one-inch tiles set in place, which happens when there's a fire, the hearth sparkles from the one-by-one -one iridescent tiles. Next is the sunroom, garden room at Stan Hewitt Hall in Akron, Ohio, uh, the home of the Cyberling family. And this house is now open to the public, so you can visit and see the sunroom. And it's a legend of the Well of St. Kian. And the young bride is holding a broken rock's egg from which the water pours out into the fountain itself. Another one in Detroit's historic Indian village is the Roscoe B. Jackson House. He was vice president of Hudson Motor Car Company. The house is tiled throughout with Powabic tile. The hallways, the sunroom, the fountain and fireplace, and this particular image is the library fireplace. Another that we chose was Cranbrook House, a 1920 fireplace for an addition that George Booth put on. George Booth was the uh, publisher of the Detroit News, uh, first president of the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts, 
of which Miss Perry and Horace Calkins were founding members. And this is a lovely installation demonstrating the use of iridescent tiles, decorative tiles, and bands of gold one-by-one -one tiles to create the edge. Again, there were many we could choose from. These are some less likely seen, and we thought they would be appropriate in this exhibition. We'll now have a look at some of the work of William, well, some of the ecclesiastical work for sacred spaces that forms a fourth of our exhibit here. Puabic's first ecclesiastical installation was that of the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Detroit on Woodward and Hancock, and was designed by Ralph Adams Cram, Boston architect known for his Gothic revival and church building. Cram was also president of the Society, Boston Society of Arts and Crafts. The church is a symphony in tile work from the narthex floor up to the sanctuary floor. And we have in this exhibit a sample, a tile sample, made for the architect in 1908. Um, it's well worth a visit, open to the public. The reredos were carved, especially for the church. And the artwork goes throughout. The tile changes from unglazed oxide tinted tiles coming in to these ivory browns in the choir floor to an absolute dark, bright, uh, blue iridescent tile on the sanctuary floor. And one reporter referred to this tile as starry as the skies of ancient Egypt. How they knew the skies of ancient Egypt were starry, I'm not sure. But the glaze name that stuck with that was Egypt Blue. Another church that was done in Detroit um, is Church of the Most Holy Redeemer. It's a Catholic parish church. And again, tile being used throughout. Uh, the church itself. Uh, Mary Chase uh, employed some of the same designs in, in the altar place, but in quite a different interpretation. St. Paul's being 1908 to 1912, Church of the Most Holy Redeemer, uh, 1922 to 26. We feature in the exhibit also two sculptural pieces uh, executed by Gwen Lux, a student of Mary Chase Stratton's at Pottery in 1927. These were for the North Woodward Congregational Church at Woodward and Blaine, now St. John's. Uh, over the doorways are, is law in this lunette, and then over the baptistry is love. And these are oxide tinted and also slip decorated portions with iridescence used to highlight the sculpture itself. We also feature some tiles from St. Paul's as well as one of the sketches from the sanctuary itself. From that, we're going to look at the work by Mary Chase Stratton's husband, the architect William Stratton, also a potter in his own right, and another potter that came to Puwabek, Alexis Laptev, a white immigre, Russian immigre, who graduated from architecture school at U of M in 1930, found himself in the Depression and no work, and ultimately lived five years with the Strattons and worked at the pottery, creating his own designs and, and installations.